So I've gone live live on YouTube. So good evening to all of you and uh, Sister Asha, our uh, uh, anchor for this evening will begin. Yeah, I'll begin, Sister. Yes. Okay. Uh, so once again, a very good evening to all of you. Every year on this day, March 8th, the world celeb together celebrates the International Women's Day. And so first of all, let me wish you all a happy Women's Day. It is a day not exclusively for women, but I believe that it is a day when humanity is celebrated as a whole. It is a day when the world is complete. It is a day when you love yourself as you are, because Jesus has said, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So once again, a very good evening to all of you gathered here. On behalf of Vijnana Deepa Center for Women's Studies, I would like to extend a cordial welcome to Fr Professor Francis Gonzalez, the president of Nyana Deepa, Professor John Karuvelil, Dean of the Faculty of Theology, Professor Nishan Irudaya Dasan, Dean of the Faculty of Philosophy, and all the teaching and non-teaching staff of Nyana Deepa. A heartfelt welcome to the moderator for today's webinar, Sister Prabina Rudam, the panelist, Professor Evelyn Monterio, Dr. Mudita Menon Sodel, and Sister Joanna de Souza. Finally, I would also like to welcome Dr. Fabian Jose, moderator of the CWS Residence, Dr. Patricia Santos, director of the Center for Women's Studies, students of the Faculty of Philosophy and Theology, women religious, and all who are virtually present for this webinar. Once again, a warm welcome to all of you. Joyce Mayer says, prayer should always be our first response to every situation. So let's begin our webinar with a prayer song and dance by Sister Remy and group from the CWS community. Thank <laughs> you. 
you, dear sisters, for leading us in prayer. The campaign theme by the UN for International Women's Day 2022 is Break the Bias. Whether deliberate or unconscious, bias makes it difficult for women to move ahead. Knowing that bias exists isn't enough. Action is needed to help the playing field. But we first need to awaken the consciousness, consciousness of all people, starting with women themselves. So in line with the UN theme, Break the Bias, and the Catholic Church's theme on synodality, the Center for Women's Studies here at JV celebrates this Women's Day with the theme, Awakening Women Religious Consciousness for a Synodal Church. So for this, we are happy to have with us Sister Prabina Rudu to moderate the day's webinar. Sister Prabina is presently teaching theology at Vidya Jyoti Delhi, and to our credit, she's finished her licensure in systematic theology last year from Nyanadipa. Sister, we are happy to have, have you here today, and over to you, Sister Prabina. Thank you very much, Sister Asha. Uh, I felt nostalgic to see CWS sisters on the screen. And my love and wishes to all of you. Uh, today, we have gathered here to celebrate all women who have contributed in advocating the equality of gender at all levels and have made our lives what it is today. We also celebrate all women present here who have the responsibility to promote equality, to make a gender equal world for our future women. Therefore, the theme of today is carefully chosen, awakening women religious consciousness for our synodal church, which will be unfolded by our first speaker, Sister Evelyn Montero. She belongs to the congregation of the Sisters of Cross of Shavanon. She is a professor of systematic theology at several theologates. Sister Evelyn has been a promoter of synodality not from 10th of October 2021, but much before. I recall when I had presented her article towards partnership in the participatory church, a feminist dream and vision. Now, when I recall that article, which has, or rather the pre uh, preparatory document and weather Miku, which has been given to us has a lot of resemblance with this particular article, which I had mentioned earlier. So today we are glad to have Sister Evelyn, a prophet of synodality, who has been promoting synodality. So we are very glad, Sister, that you are with us. So we are eagerly waiting to hear you. Over to you, Sister. Thank you, Sister Prabina, for your kind words. And uh, happy Women's Day to all of you. Since the time is limited, I shall be quick in presenting it. I've not pre prepared a PowerPoint, so I will read my presentation, okay? Because of lack of time, I couldn't do it. The global ethos of plurality is undergoing severe interruptions, sometimes in the direction of forming conflicting identities and divisive walls with potentially disastrous consequences. We are rapidly moving towards enemy inf infected by the virus of indifference. Ethical apathy to care for the other is hidden sinfulness hounding our global society. On discerning the world system, Pope Francis presented to humanity two illuminating social encyclicals, Laudato Si and Fratelli Tutti. The first on the interconnectedness of the world and the other on social friendship. Fratelli Tutti reaffirms that human life is a sacred gift. Its universal call to a culture of encounter and solidarity encompasses the whole world, transcends every human barrier and embraces everyone. 
With the challenges of the global context also changing the ecclesial context, Pope Francis is staking the future of the church on the implementation of a synodal church throughout the global Catholic community. The current synodal process of communion, participation and mission is an essential part of the Pope's ecclesial agenda to stimulate a new way of being church based on a culture of encounter, dialogue and mutual listening among all Catholics. Synodality is a style. It is walking together to actualize the conciliar vision of the church as people of God in the third millennium. A church of communion, imaging the Trinitarian communion and participation in a common mission. Synodality has become not an optional possibility, but an urgent necessity. We live in an age in which people are becoming increasingly aware of their dignity, their freedom, self-sufficiency, and their agency in every realm of life. Are Indian women religious also becoming aware of the human dignity, freedom, and agency? Or is our identity as human beings and as women still conditioned by the socio-cultural patriarchal constructs and further conditioned by our religious identity and its attachments? Are Indian women religious liberated from the binary toxic opposition of masculinity, femininity, derived from socio-cultural and religious upbringing, stereotypes and interests, in the family, society, and church. Women religious have perhaps accumulated and internalized a bag full of pseudo identities on life's journey. A fixated model of Indian manhood and womanhood and of exercising one's gender role, which is evident in almost every social and ecclesial institution can be a serious block in actively participating in the process of birthing a synodal church in India. What does awakening women religious consciousness for a synodal church imply and entail? Women religious need to take proactive measures to awaken our dominant consciousness and maybe an almost passive response to the Pope's urgent call to usher in a synodal church. Like the hemorrhaging woman, the Samaritan woman, Mary Magdalene, Phoebe, and other emancipated women in the scriptures who crossed socio-cultural and religious barriers to become empowered and active missionary disciples of Christ, we are challenged to cross boundaries that hinder our growth to be empowered women in the life and mission of the church. We need to believe in our self-worth as human beings, own our feminine dignity, our feminine energy and strength as women. Owning our unique feminine dignity and constructively investing our feminine energy and strength to stand tall is fundamental. For our strength is a capacity to transform others. And our weakness is our ignorance about our own power, affirms Sister Maria Nirmalini, the newly elected president of the Conference of Religious Men and Women in India. She further states, we keep blaming the patriarchal system and clergy suppression. Time has come to empower sisters to become assertive and remain dignified while playing creative roles within the church. 
A synodal church is not about a reversal of gender hierarchical order. It is not about a fight against clergy power and domination. Engaging in such power games to be liberated from clergy imperialism defeats the purpose of a synodal church of communion and participation. Women religious and the clergy need to uphold and respect the dignity, freedom, and equality of one another. Women religious must become dignified, assertive, and confident to disapprove and protest verbal or nonverbal abuse or when treated disrespectfully or unjustly. We must be emboldened to voice our views and opinions on common platforms and speak out against the servitude we may be subjected to in the church. And Pope Francis encourages that. It is such priests who need liberation from the patriarchal mentality that goes against the Christian spirit and witness, states Sister Nirmalina. In Fratelli Tutti, Pope Francis underlines the urgent need for a culture of encounter, not confrontation. Today, sorry, if the culture of encounter is taken as a covenant, it will create a sense of connectedness in diversity and difference. Becoming bridge builders of the gaping gender gap and agents of promoting a culture of walking and working together on the synodal journey with mutual acceptance and respectful relationality will birth a church of communion and participation for the common mission. An ethics of fellowship and friendly coexistence, not based on the logic of fear and closed mindedness, but on responsibility, respect, and sincere dialogue will be effective signposts on the roadmap of synodality in the church. There will always be tension between where the spirit is leading us and the force of long established traditions. Pope Francis is concerned about beginning the right processes and not excessively preoccupied about reaching with a deterministic mindset a set goal. A challenge is being opened now to how the spirit might be calling us in new times and circumstances. When he announced the synod on synodality, it was not just a matter of having another synod as an event. It is about synodality as a way of being church a way of bringing people together to encounter each other, to listen, to dialogue, and forge a global church of solidarity, of oneness, of communion for mission, after the Trinitarian model of communion. To become active participants in this ecclesial call to change, we, women religious, need to introspect and revamp our formation at all levels. Just to give a few suggestions, we need to update oneself with the new socio-political, economic, and technological trends that are impacting our life and mission. Theological formation should be mandatory. Networking among religious congregations and with the laity for the common mission must be given priority. Advocate training in sexuality, which will be taken up in, by one of the speakers, and relational and inclusive leadership. On this International Women's Day, let it not be merely an annual feature, 
let us resolve to love ourselves, claim our space, liberate ourselves from all the clutches that are limiting our freedom to live our lives fully, as one Indian woman put it today. We are a strong mission force of over a lakh women religious in India. Let's join hands in solidarity, acknowledge and appreciate our collective strength. Let us dream together as co-travelers. Let us walk together irrespective of our congregation and charisms, along with our brother priests and the laity to birth a synodal church of communion, partnership and participation in a common mission and for a common mission. We can change the game. Together, we can make it happen. Thank you. I hope I've kept to the time. You, you actually uh, took lesser time than what was given okay. to you. Uh, but thank you very much, uh, Sister Evelyn. Synodality is not an option, but a necessity. And awakening our consciousness of self-worth as human beings and our own feminine dignity, energy, and strength to own it. Thank you very much, Sister, for giving us a very powerful, uh, powerful presentation. And uh, without delay, we go to the second speaker because all three presentations we shall uh, look at together at the end in a QA session uh, in order that all of us get chance. So we have a second speaker, Sister Mudita Menon Sodhar. Uh, she is a religious sister of Sacred Heart of Jesus. She holds a PhD in anthropology from the University of Mumbai. She has rendered 46 years of service as a teacher, guide, principal, manager, and advisor. Indian culture and festivals, interfaith dialogue, eco-spirituality, art from waste, and women's issue are some of her special interests. She is an avid reader and writes scientific papers, articles, and letters to the editor in newspapers and magazines. She is a cancer survivor, the coordinator of justice, peace, and integrity of creation for her congregation in India for the past 10 years. The, present, uh, the president of Fellowship of Indian Missiologist uh, India and on the UCAN editorial board. Presently, she does eco-spirituality on a full-time base. Today, she is here to present Awakening Women Religious Consciousness through Fostering Integrity of Creation for a Synodal Church. And Sister Mudita, uh, please take the floor and uh, we are awaiting to hear from you. Thank you. Okay, can you see me? Uh, can you see the slides? Yes, sister. Okay. I talk, uh, uh, good evening, dear cousins. I call you cousins. At the end of my talk, you will know why I call you my dear cousins. My topic for this Awakening women religious consciousness through fostering integrity of creation for a synodal church. To begin with, integrity of creation. It is a rational, respectful, and prudent use of creation, mindful of the needs of future generations. Creation calls for collaboration in an ongoing process. Sorry, how is it going? Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Our worldview, that is the way we see creation, life and human society, form the rationale and basis for human development and progress. Experiences of darkness invite us 
to alter our vision, clarify our priorities, and be more attentive to the things around us and within us. It invites us to embrace inner vulnerability and confronts us with our limitations and a sense of powerlessness. It reveals the depth dimension of life and the mystery of wholeness. Eco-spirituality is this mystery of wholeness. It is about the connectedness and wholeness of the universe and demands the ability to seek the light within and without. Reflecting on my own times of darkness, especially when I was diagnosed for third stage breast cancer, I was struck by the power of transformation in those moments. Cancer has been my greatest spiritual gift. I knew of knowing the essentials, of discovering things in the light, and of becoming more than I could ever imagine myself to be. Could the present pandemic and war in Ukraine be a clarion call, a moment of metanoia or conversion of heart, a Goldilocks moment, as Professor David Christian would say, or an aha moment, as the Americans would profess? When walk together in darkness, they do not only experience transformation, but also an unimaginable solidarity with one another. That is, in this phase of darkness, they discover themselves, come to see the light, and experience peace. Tamaso ma jyotir gamaya. Eco-spirituality is loving all God's creatures and living in the present moment. It may look simple, but it takes years of practice or sadhana and demands discernment, discipline, and decision. Once it becomes a habit, it is a cakewalk. Life is enjoyable, a paradise on earth, or Ram Rajya, as the Indians would say. The earth is a living entity and has consciousness. She is not simply mud and rock, but mother, dharti ma, according to the Indian perspective. In the story of earth and of life, we have already experienced three eras of life. Paleozoic era, the Mesozoic era, and the Cenozoic era. The universe is now groping its way toward a new geologic era. The universe progresses by breakthroughs and leaps forward in evolution and consciousness. In the late 1980s, Thomas Berry named this new kind of consciousness that leads to a new geologic era as the Ecozoic era. We live in a time of profoundly dysfunctional and maladaptive geological force. COVID-19 makes this very evident. Challenge before us humans is to consciously prescribe a future life enhancing new cosmology and a vibrant earth community. And we are genetically endowed for cultural or transgenic solutions as to how to live. Could interrelatedness be the new normal? At present, eco-spirituality seems to be the best solution and perhaps the compelling new uh, normal, the new, the compelling new model. Eco-spirituality is a way of life and has to do with relationships, a triptych of relationships with God, faith, with other human beings, and with creation, justice. It is a way of living our life in relation to our home, the earth, Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam, 
the world is one family. The earth nourishes those who care for the whole. When the wicked grow in leaps and bounds, God intervenes. Mother Earth, with the help of the asteroid, obliterated the giant dinosaurs. That God is intervened now in the guise of the pandemic and war in order to transform all of us, especially religious, to bring about justice in the world, to help us to connect with one another in true love. We humans are part of the web of life and are fully interconnected with the biosphere. We are all related. Each of us is a cousin to the other. That's why I call you my dear cousins. And Evelyn too spoke about this interconnectedness. We live off each other. One makes a sacrifice for the other. The plants make a sacrifice and become food for us and so on and so forth in the web of life. And Thomas Merton tells us that contemplation is the keen awareness of the interdependence of all things. In a nutshell, eco-spirituality is a more personal and engaged spirituality. It is an immersion in God and nature. It calls us to focus on performing each act with integrity and purpose. Deep experiences change us every day. All we need to do is know, notice, pause, and open wide our six senses to see, hear, smell, taste, and touch the divine in creation and all around us. It invites us to connect with and heighten our awareness with the unceasing flow of God consciousness. Spirituality challenges us to plunge courageously into deep wells of wisdom from science, religion, indigenous peoples, women, mysticism and art to realize the creative energy of the divine bubbling up and pulsating through every molecule and people on this sacred earth. It unleashes, unleashes vitality, creativity, and playfulness. It is egalitarian and pluralistic, rejoicing in the manyness of beings that interconnect in a rich cosmic community. It is a spirituality needed for an ecological peacemaking and a just world community. Eco-spirituality challenges us to Maha Prajna or great awareness and Maha Karuna or great compassion, which are the greatest virtues in nearly all religious traditions. They make life meaningful. Virtues challenge us to co-suffer, suffer with and feel another's sufferings so deeply as to be moved to alleviate it. These virtues tie us to humanity, link us with the divine, and make us responsible to and for one another. It implies and expects action. It is not enough to be compassionate. We must act. So having uh, understood what is integrity of creation for a synodal church. But what is a synodal church? Evelyn has told us in great detail, so I really don't have to go through this. But anyway, a quick. A synodal church is a church that journeys together as people of God and invites us to learn something of eco-spirituality, love and live uh, synodality in order to contribute in the building up of the body of Christ, the church. It demands of the promptings of the spirit, evaluation and decision-making with Christians, Mother Earth and all God's creatures. It calls us to journey together as a family, Amoris Letitia, as sisters and brothers, Fratelli Tutti, together with God's creation, Laudato Si. 
A synodal church must be a proclaiming church. For example, Father Stan Swami, Swami, unfortunately today, truth has become bitter, dissent is intolerable, and justice has become out of reach. Women religious dissenters are blamed, shamed, and even put behind bars, while the male culprit gets caught free with money, power, and political clout. A synodal church must proclaim truth and justice and speak up against injustice and repression. A silent church is a dead church, and all worship is meaningless. Similarly, a silent woman religious is an inauthentic religious, and her consecration is a farce, a hoax, and a counter witness. Women religious are called to be leaders, animators, shepherdesses, to lead from the front and be the walkie-talkie gospel from whom people can read a page each day. We women religious need to let ourselves be educated by the spirit to a truly synodal mentality, which is why awakening women religious consciousness for a synodal church is so very vital and urgent. We need to know the purpose and phases of the synod. Dream big, chota sapna dekna paap hai, so said Abdul Kalam. Prophesy, see vision, hope to flourish. We need to inspire trust, build up wounds, weave together relationships, and learn from one another so that from our treasure trove, we can enlighten minds, warm hearts, and our hands. How can we women religious do this? The three formula seems to be a good beginning. We have a long way to go, but let's begin somewhere. Sound spirituality, for example, eco-spirituality, suffering society, the pandemic, war in Ukraine, serious studies, personal commitment and responsibility. Evelyn made this very clear. It is not, uh, it is not a luxury any longer. It's a necessity for religious life. What is the synodal toolkit and pathways best suited for us women religious? Ignorance today is no longer bliss. We need to learn from others, feminist voices, sisters in solidarity, Catholic religious of India, Forum of Religious for Justice and people and even lay people have so much to teach us. Discernment, discipline and decision making are vital. We women religious are divided on grounds of position, power, money, influence, etc. Isn't this a contradiction and a counter witness? This is the fundamental call and challenge for a synodal church, not convenience, but the common good of all. I have this own, uh, I have this problem in my own community. Choosing a semi-automatic washing machine instead of a fully automatic one, our lifestyles have to prove what we are, both at the personal level and the community choices that we make. Experience shows that most decisions are taken on the basis of caste, language, and other power politics. Administration too is done by a few ordained who keep their positions ensured and also for their clan. Corruption, maladministration of properties, abuse of power, etc., is rampant today. Laity and we women religious must participate and not be peer, mere silent spectators or worse still, victims, for example, the Franco Mulakal case. Think Hatke out of the box. Be innovative, creative, and dare to be different. Instead of having just one way of praying, move beyond. See God in all things and all things in God, as St. Ignatius said. Look at other spiritualities, religions, ways of meditating, new cosmology, Ubuntu, etc. Unity. Huh. You have uh, uh, one minute to wind up. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, I can go fast here. Okay, I don't know what I missed. So truth, uh, what is peace? Uh, sorry, sorry, well, let me go to the one. I'll only, oh God, just a minute. I'll jump through some of the things, okay. A prerequisite for change makers is inner peace. What then is peace? Peace is an inner state of the mind, a stillness of calm and tranquility within, feeling anchored, safe, and protected. True peace is an inward which comes a mastery of self and being focused. 
experience it and let your radiance shine forth to create the ripple effect all around. We need to galvanize a land for faith that does justice, no matter what the consequences. Uh, example is Father Bismar Dias from Goa who was murdered, Sis Sister Walsa John from Jharkhand who was murdered. New way of being church, the well-being and common good of all God's creatures, deep and respectful listening, participation and co-responsibility of all laity, consecrated and ordained, the form, lifestyle and the structure of the church must be synodal. Fidelity to the word of God, it enlightens and grounds us in our tradition, forming the synodal path rooted in the concrete life of the people. And conclusion, momentum, intuition, and faith are all important. Young women religious need to be protagonists. The synodal church needs to be more appreciative of women and provide them spaces for participation and mission of the church. And finally, like Zacchaeus, we need to want to encounter God, have our finger on the heartbeat of the last, least, and lost, be courageous, have parisia integrating freedom, truth, and charity, in order to keep the church youthful and young. Nothing is unachievable. If one has the right mindset and a cartload or even just a splash of courage as our mind controls our body, it's high time that we women religious break social myths and stereotypes and take up challenging ministries. My 15 minute presentation is only at the individual personal level, which is fundamental. I have not touched the collective social responsibility. Thank you. Thank you, Sister uh, Vidita, for uh, letting us into the mystery of wholeness. And without delay, we go to the third speaker, that is Sister Joanna D'Souza. She is a member of the Daughter of St. Paul and is based in Bandra, Mumbai. She completed her BTH from JD Pune. And in 2019, her MTH at Vidya Jyoti College, Delhi. She is a member of the Association of Moral Theologians in India. She has given session to many groups, including formators, catechists, charismatic prayer groups, priests, religious, lay, laity at CBCI level. She was listed by Dimension Global Christian uh, Chamber of Commerce among the 15 women achievers of India. She has authored five books for children and youth an antique number of articles for the Examiner and other Catholic journals and magazines, one best-selling youth novel being Screams at Midnight. Presently, she is the nodal coordinator of FABC OSC VASCOM for Western Region India and Digital Apostolate Representative for India in her own congregation. She is also one of the national office bearers of Cygnus World Catholic Association for Media Professionals. Presently, she oversees with her team the digital sales and marketing operations of the Pauline publications and communication. The theme of Sister Joanna's presentation is Awakening the Religious Consciousness, Women Towards a Synodal Church, Chastity's Power in Human Sexuality. Over to you, Sister Joanna. Thank you very much, dear Sister Prabina. I'm happy to meet Prabina again after uh, two or three years when we were in Vidyajyoti together. And uh, thank you for introducing me. And I would request Sister Rekha to start the PowerPoint. Welcome uh, to all of you who are here. Good evening to all of you. Thank you for staying back up to this time to listen to me. So as uh, Sister Prabhina has said, my topic is uh, chastity's power in human sexuality under the umbrella theme of women towards a single church. As much as we celebrate Women's Day today, every religious sister or brother in this webinar has entered into the season of Lent last Wednesday. And uh, Joel the prophet challenged you and me once again, rend your hearts, not your garments, rend your hearts, the heart, the heart, which is the font of emotion, the heart, which is the font of love and affection. Let me start with a bomb. Most religious women and men are afraid to admit that they have or have had sweet, 
tender, wholesome relationships with some human person at some time or the other. Our fear of talking about our relationships could be because of worries of losing the very relationship or maybe of being labeled as different from the other religious members in our community or in our province. It's quite understandable, keeping in mind the differing cultures we all come from, the way our parents have taught us about ourselves, our village has formed us. As they say, it takes a village to uh, grow a child. But most often, it could be because of the lack of understanding of the very vow of chastity or celibacy. The very term friend or relationship seems to be by some a bit not to be talked of in some religious communities or circles. It is true that there are deliberate cases of extremes which are a scandal against the vow of chastity. Nevertheless, a rose is a rose is a rose, as the idiom goes. Or a rose by any other name would smell just as sweet. And let, let's say that that is the beauty of chastity and its power in human sexuality. So let's talk about chastity and celibacy. You see the, pic the picture of two trees here, one dry and one fresh. Look at these. When you think of chastity or celibacy, what picture it relates to according to you? Don't tell me the answer. If according to you, it's chastity or celibacy is the dry, lifeless bark, Lord have mercy on all those who are living with you. You may have judged them tremendously by now, especially if according to their understanding of celibacy and chastity, they have chosen the fresh and evergreen bark. But it's never too late to allow ourselves to understand chastity or celibacy in the way Jesus did. But before going to Jesus, let's look at the difference between the two. Or is there a difference? Well, celibacy from the Latin kailibatus is the state of voluntary being, voluntarily being unmarried, sexually abstinent, or both, usually for religious reasons, like for the sake of the kingdom of God, the reign of God. Chastity includes, however, an apprenticeship in self-mastery which is a training in human freedom. The alternative is clear. Either human beings govern their passions and find peace, or lets him or herself be dominated by them and become unhappy. And chastity is a much broader term. As such, while relatively few people adopt celibacy as a voluntary lifestyle, all human persons seek chastity in their quest for happiness in a way all human persons, I say, in a way, according to natural law. For Christians, because chastity is a mandatory principle according to the sixth commandment, and celibacy is a voluntary one, it helps us to appreciate this virtue in its context. Experience and media tell us that the unchaste person very often invites chaos and suffering upon themselves and others and also invites a misuse of power in relationships as we have seen in the media these days, as well as imperiling the confidence of the community of faith. According to the Vatican document, Truth and Meaning of Human Sexuality, which was published in 1995, chastity means the successful integration of sexuality within the person and thus the inner unity of the person in his or her bodily and spiritual being, which could, according to one's vocational status, either mean to have no sexual relationship or not have sexual relations outside marriage. And it is the virtue that directs our human sexuality toward its proper purpose. And the catechism would say, sexuality in which the person's belonging to the bodily and biological world is expressed, becomes personal, 
and truly human only when it is integrated into the relationship of one person to another in the complete and lifelong mutual gift of a man and a woman and as religious we have been instructed right from our novitiate days that in order to call one's self virtuous there is a need for moderation in everything even before joining the religious life i'm sure our parents instructed us thus chastity is also regarded as fundamental to the practice of catholic life in general because it involves self mastery by attaining mastery over one's passions reason will and desire one can harmoniously work together with others you know that to do what is good to do the mission and by dear and my dear beloved in christ that is why chastity is an important aspect to dwell upon today for an authentic journey in synodality which actually means walking together in love in a universal sacrificial that is the agapeic love and in a filial love for those who don't know yet the other two kinds of love as you can see on the powerpoint are heros eros you would say in english or heros in greek in greek and storge that is the familial love so let's look at jesus the chaste person jesus was fully human jesus was fully human and fully divine hypostatic union we know this from our tradition council of ephesus and then council of chalcedon reflecting on chastity also concerns reflecting on the body of jesus in his article the body as a sign simone reflects on the human body of jesus jesus's body was a place of action he says we see in the gospels that in his body jesus healed fed forgave called and taught but most of all through jesus's body humanity felt god's love yes remember the friendships jesus shared with lazarus with martha and mary jesus bared his heart out to these three and he had his apostles always with him then what about the women who came in contact with jesus well in mark 15:40 to 41 we see that the women provided for jesus and the apostles out of their resources luke 8 1 to 3 also testifies this mary the mother of jesus mary magdalene joanna susanna mary mother of james the younger and salome they followed him and stayed with him and while he was dying even after the disciples deserted him joanna whose husband was herod's administrator even helped prepare his body for burial and mary waited outside the tomb of his dead body these were among jesus's friends friendship true friendship what about the one who anointed his feet with perfume and wiped them with her hair at any time when jesus was with women and men with women let us say even as fully as being fully human even if even if the devil tempted him as he tried to tempt jesus in the gospels as we read in the last sunday even if the devil would have tried to tempt him jesus in the capacity of his chastity may have converted that feeling into a reasonable act of will a reasonable act of will a fair and sensible form of behavior that is based on reason in fact it was a clear depiction of a well integrated body mind spirit a clear depiction of chastity and chastity affects all this in us so how is chastity related to sexuality then slide 9 for those who have not yet sensed the difference between sexuality and sex let me begin by saying sex refers to the biological aspects of being male or female 
or particular expressions of sexuality, usually genital actions like intercourse in marriage. On the other hand, sexuality is far more encompassing. It explains the, the document from the Vatican, the, on, from the Catholic education congregation, explains that sexuality is a fundamental component of our personality. One of its modes of being, of manifestation, of communicating with others, of feeling, of expressing, of living, living human love. Sexuality touches all vital areas of our life. First, it touches the relational aspect of being human itself. When we relate with each other, it is not as if we suddenly become neutral. We become more sexual, blah. When we as males or females relate to each other, to the other males or females, we are ourselves. Our sexuality is expressed, for example, in our, in our features, facial, in our body shape, complexion, our hair texture, our voice, our way of thinking also, our way of reasoning, our way of emotional being. That is, it's part of our identity, who we are. Together with all our desires, our longing, our hopes, our fears, our limitations. Since relationships determine how we communicate or fail to communicate and vice versa, the way we understand and accept our sexual selves will play an important part in our, in our journey to be communicating and fulfilled Christians and we as religious. Remember that. These relationships are essential to the Christian because they provide the context in which we become who God wants us to be. Beca by becoming religious and priests, we don't become asexual. We become, we are called to become people who can give and receive love to and from God, to and from each other, just as we are. St. John Paul II reaffirms this insight of the Second Vatican Council which is sexuality is an enrichment of the whole person, the body, emotions, the soul. In fact, Mr. Joanna, you have two minutes more. Okay, thank you. In fact, self-giving love is imprinted right in the meaning of our sexuality and bodily existence. As he says, the nuptial meaning of the body is the body's capacity of expressing love. St. John Paul II in the theology of the body. That love precisely in which a person becomes a gift and by means of this gift fulfills the very meaning of his or her being and existence. This giving is different in different states of life. Thus, our sexuality plays an important role in realizing the fulfillment of our existence, existence as human beings itself. This becomes clear from an analysis of the Genesis account of creation, male and female. We go to slide 15, Tereka. The nuptial beca meaning becomes meaningless when one is disposed to treat others as objects of self-gratification, like it's done in porn. And this happens when we fall out of sexual virtue of chastity. In fact, the human person's embodied existence reveals the fact that one needs to be alone sometimes. And at the same time, in need of others. It is through the body that one expresses and experiences the meaningfulness of love and thereby form a communion of love. This call to love and to be in communion is inscribed right in our bodies. Remaining in body alone without this experience of love does not make any sense of human existence. However, it is true, the contemplation of the body form of male and female, we realize that we are called to be a gift to one another. So then, what about the LGBTQ community? Last month in a parish in Mumbai, as part of the synodal process, these personnel were invited for a sharing and they said, we don't feel at home visiting churches. Some of us have experienced rejection. Today, friends, I put this question to you. Who is to be blamed for the experience of this kind that they had? And how can we change this experience for them? Pope Benedict and Pope Francis. Emeritus Pope Benedict and Pope Francis. 
if you read them in many of their expressions on the lgbtq community though they are open to their to the dignity of the lgbtq as human persons they still tend to bend onto the natural law theories and st john paul the second's theology of the body which keep the duality of human creation in male and female however pope asks us to pray for a better understanding and for a miracle to enhance our understanding of god and god's diversity of creation which we see in the lgbtq in fact he said in 2013 who am i to judge since i have lack of time i'll just rush up with our closing paragraph in pope francis advice to us uh, that's slide 25 sister rekha let's not be too harsh on our community members on ourselves for pope francis said in a recent international conference on priesthood that these abuses of conscience against chastity against love they emerge from deep deviations of the human personality which are to be identified and unmasked so my dear sisters and brothers in in christ in beloved my beloved in christ i would say in this talk on chastity it is not enough to make preached retreats year after year because the preached retreats come to the year they go to the heart but are they enough persons must decide to make that painful directed retreat deliberately in order to find the root causes of the problem of their disordered and distorted sense appetite because it shows in the other aspects of our community life unconsciously our disordered and distorted sense of appetite is related to how we are capacitated or able to love others the human person needs to be freed from this disordered sense of appetite free to love and within a community or a society the person can recognize how he or she is able to love love is the touchstone to judge your own disordered sense of appetite because as pope francis says love alone is chaste to conclude the synodal journey calls us women religious among others to renew our attitudes in order to live out god's call to us in our present day context with all these sexual minorities around they are also form part of the excluded the synod calls for maximum inclusion and participation and these are words from the document reaching out to involve with love especially those persons who we spoke about in line with the directives from pope francis we focus on the two interrelated goals of the process of listening to listen to god so that with god we may listen to the cries of the people and to listen to the people until we are in harmony with the will of god which calls us god's will for us is love this would mean listening to the inner voice this will help in discernment and challenge us to make a special effort to listen also to the so called unimportant persons in our community quote and quote and those who force us to consider new points of view this could in turn change our way prabina and all of us of thinking and acting for that is what synodality is all about thank you for listening to me thank you sister joanna uh, for giving us that holistic understanding of chastity and uh, sexuality uh, i thank all three panelists sister evelyn who left us with very deep question are we indian religious women still under the toxic toxic web of gender binary created by society she asked us to update ourselves with new political and technological development reviving religious formation networking with deity to love ourselves claim our space and get into the mutual mutual respect of all the gender to take part in birthing of the synodal church sister udita who took it forward by presenting us the ecclesia which does not have the boundary she took us the mystery of wholeness where all creation is one family she led us to the reflection where the great awareness or great compassion have a big bigger space she also called us to have solidarity 
with the suffering, suffering Mother Earth and suffering humanity. And leading that into a very personal, personal reflection, Sister Joanna, Sister Joanna took us to the synodal journey, which is not only outward looking, but also inward looking, our own understanding, listening and acceptance of our own bodily and spiritual existence in order to have a healthy, chaste relationship with oneself and others. And she left us saying that be free to love. Love alone is chaste. So dear friends who are all online in YouTube as well as in Zoom, now the floor is open uh, to you to place your comments, questions, and any intervention. We have three panelists with us and you could address to them, uh, you know, one person or all three. Uh, I cannot see the uh, raised hand, so you could actually unmute and uh, unmute and you know say I would like to say, or you could post it uh, in the chat box, and I shall read those questions or comments. I'm sure our uh, uh, our. Uh, audience who are present here are all struck with this deep sharing by all three of you. <clears throat> uh, so it takes time actually to take such a lot of rich material. Uh, uh, to take it uh, further, uh, yes, please use the raise hand icon, yes. And somebody could tell me who has raised the hand because I don't see except the panelists on my screen. To take it further, I have a little question to Sister Mudita. Uh, Sister Mudita, uh, it's a very good, you know, eco spirituality, which has been uh, so much part not only of religious and not only of our religion, but all religion all over. Now, I was wondering, and if you could help us uh, to uh, see that now, because of the, you know, this crowded city, you know, uh, because of that one B, uh, BHK flat, which doesn't even have a ventilation. Uh, people have people are you know uh, stuff in those kind of environment so at those kind of environment uh, how could we develop this eco spirituality when you don't even see a blue sky anymore you know so uh, how could uh, we actually help such we are blessed you know we just are blessed to have a beautiful campus uh, but the people who will who could benefit uh, with your answer maybe how could we help such uh, people to have this spirituality deepen this eco spirituality uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Prabina. That's a very good question that you asked me. Eco-spirituality is not just being out in the environment. Uh, it's a whole way of life. How you are able to surrender to God's will and not your will, which means uh, I'm willing. If there's a knock. I'm, I have already decided my day and there's a knock on the door. Uh, do I welcome that person as Atiti Deva Bhava, as somebody sent by God to interrupt me? Uh, do I do things with integrity and with finesse to the best of my ability? Doing everything with integrity is what eco-spirituality is all about. It's not just looking at the environment. You can sit in your room and listen to good music. That is also part of something that God has blessed us with. Uh, uh, even uh, human beings are all uh, creatures of God. So there are, there are so many things, even sitting with your laptop is uh, what God has blessed us with a brain to invent uh, the laptop. So it's an attitude to life. How do I celebrate life in the midst of pain, in the midst of suffering, in the midst of joy, in the midst of whatever? And how do I communicate hope in others? Because God never meant us to be sad. God meant us to be a celebrating people. We are an hallelujah people and we need to celebrate life all through 24 seven. But how do I do that when I get cancer? I said to myself, everybody else was concerned about me except myself. I said, my ticket, my visa to heaven has come. All that I need is send me my ticket, dear Lord. I'm ready for heaven. And then he didn't send me the ticket. I'm still alive. So I said, okay, 
my uh, my room in heaven interior decoration is going on so fine lord keep on decorating my interior <laughs> decoration of my room in heaven because i feel sure and each of us have that uh, we claim our rightful place in heaven because we are baptized christians god has blessed us we are all called to be saints and if we are not saints and then we are not doing god's will all of us are called to be saints and to help one another to be saints that's the essence of eco spirituality which means i must be kind to the plants to the birds to the animals to creatures everybody and everything that i do i must do it work is worship if i do it as i'm doing this for my god of course if i have a lecture or if i have a, now just before the webinar started some uh, jesuit from uh, called me i said excuse sorry sorry i can't talk to you just now because i have to be in time for the webinar i'll talk to you later so it's the little things of life that eco spirituality is all about it's a way of living it's a lifestyle what are the choices i make uh, sister one more question is there for you sister mudita yes. that yes. is just to explain in very short maybe brief uh, that uh, you called us cousins and chief <laughs> fernandez is asking explain how we are cousins so if you could uh, you know in very uh, uh, what was it precisely or concisely you could share with us after the sister <laughs> you have Okay. Okay. Wonderful. I'm so happy you asked that. You know, uh, earlier I never called uh, uh, anybody who I have met for the first time. I'll say dear, and where anyone whom I have, I know or I have met, I call them my dear, and I always end up with lovingly. Now, why do I do this? Because science has proved that we are all cousins. We are related in different different ways with birds, animals, and other human beings. So there is a scientific uh, um, uh, explanation now. Uh, how all of us are connected uh, the web of life uh, and in in many many ways uh, we are connected you will see how you can do a dna and you will see from where you have originated and imagine the mystery and the beauty of uh, this body that we are the person that we are each one of us is unique our fingerprints tell us that and the eyeballs of our eyes tell us that we are totally different from everybody else and yet we are connected we are connected in very different ways i need a whole hour to explain to you scientifically how we are connected and how we are cousins of one another the birds the animals the trees the plant everything around us that's why i call everybody i i can prove it to you but i need a whole hour and i don't have it just now a uh, jude fernandez if you are listening to us you can actually connect with sister mudita for it <laughs> to get more insights uh, we have uh, a question means rather a statement uh, someone uh, asking about lgbt to be included at all levels and sister joanna also has got a direct i think message about lgbt if she could enlighten us uh, uh, in you know in just yeah thank you prabina um uh, what question came to me directly was can you say something more about lgbt well i like to say this to explain today uh, there is a difference between sex and gender you know it's understood differently a uh, sex as i already explained is like male and female you know but when we say gender identity it is one's inner sense one's inner sense of one self as male or female or other or neither uh, or a mixed so the person himself herself or other self understands that she he or or other uh, feels that way sexually so if you want to know someone's gender identity you need to ask nowadays even in the forms which we fill we get male female or other then there is something called gender expression and gender expression is the way one expresses one expresses one's gender identity outwardly uh, depending on how they feel depending on how they are brought up also in some cultures i think it's uh, if i'm not mistaken some uh, very uh, primal mexican cultures they don't even uh, kind of tell the child if he's a girl or a boy till the child understands uh, when they grow up what they feel that is the openness so this gender expression is a way one expresses one's gender outwardly in external and socially constructed 
signals like in a clothing the haircut their voices it just comes i mean they cannot choose that in the mannerisms the way the, the either femme or uh, you know more tomboyish or whatever and uh, the term gender it refers to the socially constructed roles like what we would uh, now uh, society has constructed uh, because also of uh, since ages we have we also as catholics we have been used to the a uh, duality of male and female which comes to us from genesis and also it's propounded in uh, theology of the body by uh, st john paul the second so gender refers to socially constructed roles behaviors activities and attributes that are given society considers appropriate for men and women like a stereotype like women uh, should be housewives and they should uh, kitchen, do the kitchen work which today we see differently and uh, gender includes matters of sex gender identity and gender expression while male and female are terms related to sex only masculine and feminine refer to gender you can see that is a little bit of a dif difference so oh. there is something called transgender and i have mentioned it in my powerpoint also that is a term people it's for people whose uh, gender identity or expression or behavior is different from those typically associated with their assigned sex at birth they may be born as uh, with the uh, male uh, sexual organs or the female sexual uh, genital organs but uh, they feel differently so a narrower definition indicates a person whose gender identity is different from their gender assigned as birth as i said so uh, that is more okay and uh, the word queer which comes as lgbtq it is an umbrella term it's an umbrella term for members of all sexual minorities thank you uh, we have a lot of hands raised as well as a lot of question in inbox so we have reina reina who has raised her hand after reina uh, ayana then i shall read out the questions if it is on the uh, chat box uh, and if the huh. answer or the question are kept brief because there are a lot of a lot of people who want to uh, you know relate with you yes sir uh, okay thank you thanks for uh, prabhu uh, my question is directed mostly to evelyn okay do the others touched it also uh you know you emphasize the need for theological formation of sisters uh my question is there are so many of female religious who are theologically trained so is there a possibility of an alternative formation rather than the seminaries which will really nearly have the patriarchal uh, um slant shall we say in the formation yeah and uh, there's one one is the patriarchal slant and it's also the western slant and religious sisters as well as the laity have growing up in a pluralistication context so how can theology be contextualized and uh, feminized I mean, when we are giving it to the sisters and please don't forget that we laity also are thirsting and waiting thanks reena for that uh, very pertinent question that you have asked true what you say is if you do um theology in a setup like that in a seminary or whatever in a theology run by men there may be a tendency for the patriarchal slant etc but from my own experience i've done my theology at vidya jyoti and then again at uh, the masters at uh, nyanadeep and then my doctorate i did it in paris and it was mixed you know it was uh, with both men and women and i found that that was very helpful to me personally because i was brought up in a family that is uh, you know the typical traditional type where we are and i had no brothers only girls in the family and our upbringing is also that way you know the catechism classes in school and etc by the nuns but this was an opening for me secondly i have also learned uh, i have also exposed to critical thinking you know when different people ask questions from different viewpoints it helps and it urges me it also motivates me to think and question so in that way and i would say that it would be helpful 
it would be you know empowering as it were to do theology in a mixed institution you know rather than just exclusively for women i have seen the setup also in in institution that are only for women you can see the difference so it does make a difference so that is why i wouldn't uh, go in for a kind of an exclusivist studying of uh, theology with regard to western uh maybe because uh, it happens it does happen what you say is true is because of the syllabus and we have got to abide by certain things etc but as far as possible again from my own experience we do try to impart theology from the indian perspective or from the asian perspective as far as possible as far as possible but because of the teachings we have to abide by the magisterial teachings etc also sometimes it gets it give it's uh, it takes on that western slant it's up to us those who are teaching to you know contextualize it and make it uh, useful or pertinent relevant for us for our culture for our contexts thank you i hope i've, I hope I've responded to you rena No, you've forgotten that I'm a said that lady also a person. Yes, yes, yes. Sure, <laughs> sure. <laughs> so you are definitely have... included. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sister Evelyn and Raina, for your uh, question. We have Ayana, and after Ayana, we have lots of question in chat box. But we <laughs> are short of time. What we could do, I can propose to Sister Pratisha that that we will collect this question. We'll note down your names. We'll try to connect with our speakers and get back to you if that is okay. Because we uh, are. Prabina, it would be nice if you just read off the questions. Okay. Maybe we not may not be able to answer all the questions, but if you read, it will be good for everyone to hear because I don't think everyone can see the questions. Okay. Okay. So I shall uh, first. We will uh, go to Ayana. Yeah. Yes. Ayana, you have to unmute yourself. He's not responding to the invitation to unmute. So yeah. maybe you can carry on. You you read the questions. So I shall read the questions as well as there are a lot of uh, appreciation, but I shall read only the question. Uh, Sister Mudita spoke about embracing new spirituality. Would be alienating a traditional Christian community in that way. How we can take everyone together. then we have also question sister i have one question to ask you uh, from you how to help my sisters who have been gone through lots of hurtful experience because of relationship uh, then we have same question hurtful so these are two question i think sister joanna if you could briefly uh, address this question after, and then we should after mudita yeah. okay Sister, I think Sister Mudita is out. Mudita is out. So can you can you take over, Jayana? Oh. Okay, sure. Uh, yes, I received this uh, question even personally, so I uh, directed her to give it to the moderator because it's the best. Uh, dear sister, uh, I uh, would would suggest that not only the sister, even there are there are uh, brothers who are go have gone through hurtful experiences in their past, either in their childhood or uh, during the time. of their religious life uh, uh, first of all see if she or he wants to be free from those kind of uh, you know the effects of those experiences some of us are not yet ready because uh, if they are decide i want to change because their uh, actions in the community uh, are sorry there's a mosquito here our actions in the community uh, are coming from the unconscious which has all these traumatic experiences and i'm speaking from experience i'm speaking from experience so if the person the she or he uh, wants to be free from this uh, help her to decide to or him to decide to make a directed retreat a directed retreat from a person who has experience in helping uh, the person get out of traumatic experience sometimes uh, the sister or the brother doesn't even know that she or he has gone through a traumatic experience what in psychology they call trauma they think it oh, it's an experience uh, maybe in my family maybe in all families but uh, uh, some experiences happen only in some families 
and uh, unless and until that traumatic experience is forgiven and spoken about and you know the method the i am not a psychologist but the retreat director who is a psychologist will help and the person i'm telling you from experience the person will automatically sense herself or himself free from uh, those particular bondages which were affecting him or her in being open in being free uh, in not judging uh, persons you know otherwise we have already like a, a judge in front of this person is like that this person those things just fall off believe me they just fall off so my dear uh, sister who have asked this question uh, please do this what i said thank you thank you very much uh, sister joanna yeah. uh, now i'm sure there are a lot of question a lot of clarification uh, but we are short of time and uh, i thank all the panelists for your uh, beautiful paper presentation uh, and it was very deep so i hand it over to sister patricia uh, to uh, conclude the session So thank you, dear sisters. Uh, with this new awakening in our hearts and with the determination to break the bias, let's walk the path of synodality. So I thank you, dear sisters, once again uh, for your scholarly presentation and fruitful discussion, and for all the critical questions by the participants, both in Zoom and via the YouTube. I now call upon Dr. Patricia Santos, the director of the Center of Women's Studies and animator of the Women's Students Forum for her concluding remarks. Over to you, Sister Patricia. Thank you, Sister Asha. As we come to the end of this academic year, I thank God for being with us through this year in spite of all the ups and downs. Because of the pandemic restrictions, the Center for Women's Studies could not organize many in-person activities as we had planned. Nevertheless, thanks to the resident staff and students of CWS, we have been able to organize two webinars this year. In particular, I would like to thank Sister Fabian Jose, the moderator of the CWS residence and the core members of the Women's Students Forum, Sisters Regina Pushparani, Piari Minj, Mary Preeti Anthony, Sonia Joseph and Anna Mary for their collaboration and help in organizing these activities. I thank very specially Sister Asha Jos for being the anchor for today's program and for ensuring that everything went so smoothly. Since she will be giving the official vote of thanks, um, I'm taking this opportunity to thank her. I'm very happy that for this webinar, we could have those who have been part of Nyana Deepa at some time and in some way. Professor Evelyn Montero has taught for many years at Nyanadipa and is still visiting faculty here. Dr. Mudita, Sister Joanna and Sister Prabina have been students here. And so I extend my sincere gratitude to each one of you for awakening our consciousness on diverse aspects. I'm sure there would have been many more questions, but since we have to finish within this time limit, um, I hope that um, others will have access to you and, you know, enter into a dialogue and conversations even after the webinar. May this consciousness enable us to journey together as partners to create a gender just church and society. I also want to bring to your awareness that Nyanadipa has a one year diploma program in theology for women and women religious, besides the regular bachelor licensure and doctoral programs. We will be happy to have more enrollments for this program, if especially some are interested in you know, having only women. I hope that we will also be able to meet face to face next year for many more programs. Thank you and God bless you all. Uh, thank you, Sister Patricia, for your words. Uh, friends, we will now have a short concluding prayer, thanking the Lord for this new awareness. Sister Anna Mary from the Sri WS community, the leaders in prayer. Over to you, Sister Anna Mary. Uh, 
Good evening to all. Let us remember our own mothers and sisters. As we come to the end of this beautiful program, let us lift our minds and hearts in gratitude to God for awakening our religious consciousness for His Israel Church. We are grateful to God for the gift of our beloved Pope Francis, who initiated the synodal process in the church and has appointed many women to take up leadership positions. It was Mary of Nazareth who brought Jesus into our world and initiated this mission at Cana. God's plan was systematically executed through Mary from the Annunciation to the foot of the cross and in her continuous presence in her time today. Her philosophical question to the angel at the Annunciation and a theological reflection and spiritual contemplation at every step enabled her to play her role wisely and cooperate truly in the scientific plan of God. Mary was conscious about every happening and it is because of her credibility, consciousness and responsible action at Cana that God's glory was revealed through her in the session. Her leadership role was witnessed after the death of Jesus, when she was with the disciples in the upper room, supporting them and keeping them together. Let us imbibe the courage and consciousness of Mary for our lives and promote it among our own sisters in the communities and in our areas of ministry. Let us give praise to the Lord for the individual and collective voices and contribution of our women speakers today and pray that we may journey together to make the synodality a reality in our church today. Let us remember our own mothers and sisters for their love and dedication. We also remember and pray for women who are in pain and suffering because of violence, abuse, exclusion and discrimination. May they experience strength and consolation from the Lord to resist and raise their voices for courage, for change. Let us hold in our prayer all those children and women affected in Ukraine, Russia, and other war torn places. May peace and harmony restored in these places. May his peace reign in us. Let us conclude our prayer with Hail Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. <laughs> blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your name, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mary, Mother of God, God pray, pray for us sinners, sinners now, now and at the hour of our Father. death. Amen. Mary, seed of wisdom, pray for us. Mary, Queen of Peace, pray for us. Thank you, Sister Anna Mary. Every little bit matters to make a difference in the church and society. And so we hope that this awakening of consciousness will lead to a change of mindset and conscious efforts towards transformation with God's grace one day at a time. We will now listen to a closing hymn titled One Day at a Time.
Thank you, dear sisters. Thankfulness is not merely an attitude, but it is the epitome of spirituality. Hence, with a heart full of gratitude, I, on behalf of the Jnanadipa Center for Women's Studies, wish to thank all of you for your valuable time and active participation. A special word of thanks to the president of JD, Professor Francis Gonsalves, for his encouragement and support today and in the past for the various activities of the Women Forum. I'd also like to extend our thanks to Professor John Caruel, the Dean of the Faculty of Theology, and Professor Nishan Irudayas Dasan, the Dean of the Faculty of Philosophy, for your valuable time and presence. Our sincere thanks and appreciation to Sister Prabina Rudum, Professor Evelyn Monterio, Dr. Mudita Menona Sauder, and Sister Joanna De Souza. Thank you, dear sisters, for your valuable inputs and for making this evening relevant and meaningful. A big thank you to Sister Fabian, the moderator of CWS, for supporting and helping us in all our needs. We are grateful to our women administrative and supporting staff who give their best to Jnana Deepa and are always willing to lend a helping hand. The mastermind that worked behind this webinar was none other than that of Dr. Patricia Santos. Thank you, Sister Patricia, for this opportunity and for coordinating the entire webinar. A sincere thanks to Dr. Dinesh for the technical support before and during the webinar and to the sisters of the CW, CWS community for your hard work and contribution for the success of this webinar. And finally, a heartfelt thanks to all those who have participated in this webinar. We value your presence, your time, and your questions and appreciation. Once again, thank you and good night to all. Thank you, dear friends. So bye bye. Thank you, Sister Patricia. Thank thank you, Joanna. Yeah. Hope to and see you again you sometime. Everyone. Yes, yes. Thank you. Hopefully, <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Welcome, Sister Prabina. Ah, oh, I'd love to come back. <laughs> and Prabina, bye. Thank you so 